we have a key, a keynote speaker, Sheikh Dr. Mufti Ismail Menk with us. And before I call upon Mufti Menk for his talk, I'd like to give you a quick introduction to him. Dr. Dr. Mufti Ismail Menk is a leading global Islamic scholar born and raised in Zimbabwe. He studied Sharia in Medina, Saudi Arabia, and holds a doctorate of social guidance from Aldersgate University. Mufti's, Mufti Menk's work has gained worldwide recognition and, has been, and he has been named one of the top 500 most influential Muslims in the world since 2010. He has millions of followers across his social media platforms. He is active in the international arena and is a strong proponent of peace and justice. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please join me in welcoming Mufti Ismail Menk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I greet you with the greetings of peace. May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be upon one and all. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. I commence in the name of the Almighty, the one who created us, the maker, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, the one in whose hands lies absolute control of every aspect of existence. I send blessings and salutations upon all the messengers whom he sent to us to guide us, to remove us from the darkness, to bring us to the light. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad, peace be upon him, his companions, his household. And may the blessings of the Almighty be upon every one of us, yourselves included, and humanity at large. Amen. <clears throat> Dignitaries who are here this evening, members of the diplomatic corps, as well as the leaders of the religious denominations here in this beautiful city and country. Uh, indeed, if you allow me to call you my brothers and sisters in humanity, for that is the link that we have that cannot be denied. My brothers and sisters, we know that every faith has seasons that encourage the followers to purify their relationship with the maker and to fulfill the rights of the rest of not only mankind, but the creatures of the same maker. And Islam is no different. It's very unfortunate that what we're witnessing across the globe sometimes is not religious at all. It's something that religion does not condone, it does not teach. In fact, moments ago, I was speaking to one of the guests here, and I was making mention of the importance of the role of the religious men and women who guide their followers. And I'm talking about myself as well. This role definitely is to calm those whose hearts happen to be bubbling with anything but calmness and to guide them to become closer to their maker as well as to fulfill the rights of the creatures of the same maker. And it brings me back to the point that I started with and that is every faith has days, seasons, times of introspection through the year. In Islam, you know that the month of Ramadan is very different. It is unique, so unique that many non-Muslims who have friends who are Muslims would actually bear witness that now they are being genuine Muslims. They pray suddenly. I'm talking about those who might not be praying five times a day. And then they abstain from alcohol, which they are supposed to be doing anyway, but it happens in the month of Ramadan. And so many other uh, good qualities that are developed, the quality of being charitable, although we should be charitable throughout the year, but it seems to be in Ramadan, we become more conscious of this. So these seasons are very, very helpful. And like I've acknowledged, it's not just Islam that has these seasons. Every faith we have to acknowledge comes with seasons wherein their followers would be guided to becoming better followers. 
So in the month of Ramadan, the Almighty says, and I'm sure we've heard the verse just before I got up here, and I'd like to say a verse just before that. Ya amanu, kutiba kama kutiba min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you in the same way it was prescribed upon those before you in order that you achieve God consciousness in order that you achieve piety. If we take a look at the purpose of the fast, it is to become disciplined when it comes to that which is prohibited and that which is permissible. We become more conscious of what goes into our mouths. So if I'm conscious of what goes into my mouth through the day in the month of Ramadan, then it would make it easier for me through the next 11 months to become conscious of that which is totally prohibited from entering my system. Similarly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has made it quite clear that it's a month whereby it's not just about what goes in the mouth, but it's also about what comes out of the mouth. So he says, Whoever, during fasting, is not going to be conscious about the statements they utter and they say falsehood, lies, deception, hurtful things, they have wasted their time staying away from food and drink for the sake of the Almighty. So this means while we are fasting, we're supposed to say good words. We're supposed to increase the remembrance of the Almighty by praising Him a lot. And this is why you find during the month of Ramadan, people engage in the recitation of the Quran. It's the month of the Quran. You find people would change their CDs in the motor vehicles to Quranic CDs, and they would want to listen to the melodious recitation of the Quran. We teach them that it's not good enough to just listen to the Quranic recitation without understanding what exactly is being recited. And I call on one and all, myself included, and every one of us who's here and humanity at large to look into the scripture and not just to listen to its melody, but to see the deeper meanings and to get the correct interpretation from those with sound knowledge. And the reason I say this myself, having been given the opportunity to read or having been fortunate enough to have read quite a few scriptures, not just that of the Muslims, I definitely acknowledge that there are verses in all scriptures that need explanation. They are revealed in context. If this context is not understood, they can easily be taken out of it and they can be abused and misused. So therefore, we ask the men and women who have knowledge to take it upon themselves to reach out to the entire globe to explain to them how important it is for us to fulfill the relationships that we're meant to be having, not only with mankind, but even with the other creatures of the Almighty. And I want to cite an example. There are so many examples in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his statements where he speaks about compassion towards animals. Those of you who may not be familiar with Islamic rulings, a dog is considered an animal that if it were to lick you, you would need to wash your clothing, according to the Muslims. So therefore, a lot of the Muslims would have a relationship with a dog that would be slightly distant. Although you are allowed to have a dog as a guard dog, as a farming dog, as a, as, you know, a dog for a purpose, for the blind perhaps, but the rules and regulations are a little bit deeper when it comes to cleanliness. However, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, there was a man in the desert who was very thirsty on a hot day. And what he did was, he decided to go into a well in order to quench his own thirst. So he says, as he went into the well to quench his thirst, he emerged quite filled and he noticed a dog panting. And he said to himself, He says, I see that this dog is as thirsty as I was before I went into the well. So he decided to go back into the well because the dog was not going to go into the well. And he had no container to put the water. He decided to take his shoe and fill it with water, bring it back up, get to the dog. And like I said, you know the rules about dogs in Islam. 
He got to the dog, he brought it close to him, and he made the dog drink water from his own shoe. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, and this hadith is authentic, it is not disputed, its authenticity is not disputed by any Muslims. He says, this man was granted forgiveness and paradise as a result of the deed of compassion towards a creature of the Almighty. I have been traveling the globe for many years. I've been to so many countries and a lot of my colleagues have. And I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to address members of uh, people who belong to other faiths as well, not just today, but it has happened quite a few times. And I share a good relationship because we all preach compassion. We all preach reaching out, not just to humankind, but to the creatures of the Almighty. Take a look at the dog. I always say, if the Almighty granted forgiveness to a person for being compassionate towards an animal, such as a dog, what do you think is the reward of he or she who is compassionate to a fellow human being? And this is what we've been preaching, and this is what we teach. And there are so many such examples. There is an example of a kitten. There is an example of a lady who was nasty to a, to a cat and what happened to her. So these are examples that people cannot dispute. However, when it comes to the month of Ramadan, it is a month of giving. As you know, people become charitable. There is something known as zakah. Zakah is one of the pillars of faith. It is a percentage of the wealth and the savings of a Muslim, two and a half percent approximately, that is taken annually. Many people prefer to give it in the month of Ramadan because it's a month whereby good deeds are multiplied in reward. So as they give it, they reach out to the poor. When I don't have food in my belly, because I'm staying away for the sake of the Almighty, not that I cannot afford it, I become more conscious of those who cannot afford it. And therefore, I reach out to them. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, if you were to help someone open their fast, you would get a massive reward, a mountain of reward. So therefore, a lot of the masjids you will find, they lay uh, what is called the sufra. The sufra is like the cloth, you know, or, or the, the, the plastics that they do lay out. And they, they have the dates and the water and the uh, perhaps yogurt and bread and a few other things in order to make people open the fast because that moment is a blessed moment. It's a moment of softness. It's a moment of calmness. It's a moment of compassion. And that is the time when prayers are answered. Prayers are answered when your heart is softened. It is softened towards humanity, towards the Almighty. You realize and recognize the Maker. Part of the recognition of the maker is to know and acknowledge that you are not the only one he's made. You are not the only creature. He has made a lot of other creatures, countless. You will never know the exact number. Why would he make so many creatures and make you as well? In order to test you, what is your relationship going to be with the rest of these creatures? If I share parents, I become a sibling. With, the, with my own brother or sister, the common factor is I have a mother and a father who's the same. So I have rights and duties. Do I not realize that I have a maker who is exactly the same for all the creatures around me? He would never have made them without a purpose. So I need to reach out to them. When I've recognized this, I become closer to the Almighty. And this is why everyone has rights. The Muslims have rights. The neighbors have rights. The non-Muslims have rights. Those who are your friends have rights. Those who are your enemies have rights too. The animals have rights. Everyone has rights. We need to know these rights and we need to fulfill these rights. And subhanAllah, what better month can there be than this beautiful month of Ramadan? It is a month of the mercy of the Almighty because we are taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Simple words. Whoever does not show mercy will never be shown mercy. So if you would like to achieve mercy, there is one way of doing it. Be merciful yourself. <clears throat> In another narration, he says, the Almighty will not have mercy on he or she who does not have mercy on the rest of the people. He did not just say the Muslims. He said the rest of the people. Because 
we share so much in common, subhanAllah. So if we would like the mercy of the Almighty in this month of mercy, we need to have a quality of mercy as well. And I promise you that we as Muslims, especially the religious leaders, we know the duty that is on our shoulders and we know how important it is and we have been trying our best. We need your help and support as well. And at the same time, we acknowledge that you have gone the extra mile to attend with us this evening. Some of the faces, mashallah, are known. Some of them perhaps less known. But alhamdulillah, I thank Allah Almighty for having brought us together in such, such a good place. And we definitely do promote coexistence in a peaceful manner, respect for one another. <coughs> It is only when and if we are to respect one another that we will be able to live a life of harmony and peace. We will be happy when we live and let live and not just live and let live. In fact, I've learned something. The word tolerance is not good enough. It goes beyond that to respect. That's a higher word. I don't just tolerate you. I respect you. I really do. You have the right to believe what you do, and so do I. And in this way, we would be able to live together. We will discuss our differences. There is no harm, not at all. But we discuss it as human beings, with respect, with dignity. In the same way I would like something for myself, I need to like the same for you. And so we have been doing this for many years. It's become more and more important, as some, unfortunately, have taken the religion and try to use it to serve their own nasty agenda across the globe. And I'm sure you're aware of what I'm talking about, the extremism that is being uh, promoted and some of the violence and the acts that we definitely do not condone at all. We do, we do not, not only condone them, but we are no way party to even the slightest type of understanding that leads in that direction. So uh, this evening, I really, really feel so great to be in your midst. And I want you to feel this beautiful month of Ramadan. You know, we're fortunate that we're in a country where you can actually taste this month just by being here during Ramadan because of the majority Muslims who live here. And I'm sure you can see the goodness that stems from all the brothers and sisters and this beautiful feeling. I promise you, this is how a Muslim should be living throughout his or her lives life it is not just during the month of ramadan iftar is a moment of reflection we're supposed to be introspecting looking into my bad ways and habits how can i eradicate my bad ways and habits i've spent the better part of the last 17 years preaching and teaching how to develop ourselves as human beings not just for muslims if you were to take a, a scroll through some of my social media accounts, perhaps Facebook and Twitter, that have been there for many years, you will notice almost every message is applicable to mankind at large, not just to Muslims. And the reason I chose to do this, and I've done this for many years, is for everyone across the globe to know that as religious leaders and as Muslims, we share so much in common with those who belong to other faiths. I'm sure the respect, the character, the conduct, the benevolence, the reaching out to others in terms of compassion and mercy and so on. All faiths should be teaching this. That's what makes us human beings. So it's a warm evening, mashallah, in this beautiful city. And I really hope and pray that we can enjoy this beautiful evening. I have two more messages before I actually close. The first is, I would like to cite an example that many people may have heard in the Quran. And the reason I do this is this event or my talk is actually beamed live. And I want the Muslims across the globe to know that there are verses in the Quran that sometimes people are taking out of context in order to create enmity, in order to create discord, in order to create that which is negative across the globe. And it's our duty to clarify these. So I'm going to make one big clarification. Please bear with me. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, there is a verse that many people quote, and a lot of the people who would like to quote it out of context do quote it. And they enjoy quoting it in order to distance people of different faiths. And that verse 
verse number 51, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya. Ba'aduhum awliya u ba'ad. O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as awliya. I'm sure you may have heard that. And the term awliya is wrongly referred to as friends. It does not translate as friends. And we need to know something. The verse says, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and Christians as awliya. But the same Quran allows you to marry a woman of the book, which means a Jewish or a Christian woman. So there surely needs to be an explanation. <coughs> There definitely is an explanation. So if we go back to the Quran, we will find that there is something called tafsir. Tafsir means the explanation of the verse. Where do we look for, for the tafsir? The first place you look for, for tafsir and for an explanation when it is confusing is the Quran itself in another place. So it is called tafsir al-Qur'ani bil-Quran. That means to explain the Quran by a verse in the same Quran that has an explanation. So we may ask, what is the seeming contradiction here? There surely needs to be an explanation. On one hand, there is a verse that says, don't take them awliya. And awliya would more correctly refer to as protectors under certain conditions. Right? And in the other place, the same Quran allows you to marry their women. Now, if you go back to a few verses down, verse number 57 of the same surah, it speaks about the condition of befriending those who mock at you those who make a joke of you, those who intimidate you, stay away from them. Whether they are Jews or Christians or anyone else. And I'm sure that is an, a law that we apply in our own lives. If someone intimidates me, if they mock at me, if they laugh at me, or you, it would only be wise that I advise you to stay away from them. So you don't need to get too close to them because it's going to, in our language, rile you up. It's going to actually work on you. And if you cannot do something positive about it, then you need to be careful. So the Quran says, لا تتخذوا الذين اتخذوا دينكم هزوا ولعبا من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم والكفار أولياء. Now there is an explanation about who these people of the book are that are being referred to in the previous verse that I cited. They are the ones who mock and who joke and who rile you up and who say nasty things and so on. Stay away from them. That's the explanation. And then we have another verse, which is by far the clearest explanation of whom you are not allowed to befriend from amongst those who don't share a faith with you. <coughs> that goes to Surat Al-Mumtahina. If we go to Surat Al-Mumtahina, we will find, I think it's verse number eight, if I'm not mistaken, eight and nine, where the Almighty says clearly that the prohibition is not لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم. The prohibition is not for those who have never fought you. They belong to other faiths. They've never fought you in your faith. They've never driven you out of your homes. They have not done anything bad to you. There is no prohibition. That the prohibition is not in their regard. The Quran says you have to fulfill their rights. You know what tabarruhum actually means? A relationship that you have with people where you fulfill all their rights. Bar, the, the, the term bar is also used when it comes to your parents. You know, al-bar li walidihi. Someone who has fulfilled the rights of his parents. So you have to fulfill the rights of those who don't share a faith with you. They've never done anything wrong to you. But look how people take the first verse and use it as though it's a blanket rule to say you're not allowed to befriend any Jews and Christians. I have friends from the time I was at school. I actually studied in a Christian college, St. John's College, back at home in Zimbabwe. And a lot of my friends were Jews and Christians. But that doesn't mean that I went against the Quranic injunction because that's not the interpretation of the verse. Surah Al-Mumtahina explains it clearly. The Almighty after that makes it even more clear by saying, you want to know whom you should not take as awliya? They are the ones who have fought you, who have driven you out of your home. They are the ones who have had enmity against you to the degree that there is a war between you and them. Then it would not be in the best of your interests to befriend such people. So this, I'm just giving you an explanation because I do know that this particular verse 
is cited a lot by those who want to misinterpret it. So I've just taken a moment to explain to you that in the Quran, there are explanations to show what exactly that means. And it's common logic. And we would even give that advice to our own children that if someone is fighting you, stay away from them. You know, you have to fulfill their rights, but you don't need to befriend them. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and guidance. The second thing that I'd like to end by is that during this month, and it's a month of forgiveness, we are taught to reach out to everyone. We ask the Almighty for forgiveness. And if we would like to achieve that forgiveness, we also need to forgive others. We need to reach out to others. We need to show compassion to others. So I ask the Almighty to grant us all goodness and forgiveness and acceptance. And at the same time, I, I, I remind you all that we have a common maker. And this common maker, he is worshipped alone. And he is the one who is the owner controller of entire universe and existence and i end in the same way that i started thank you very very much for your uh, for your attentiveness and i really appreciate the fact that you've made the time to show solidarity with us during this beautiful month of ramadan and i hope and pray that we can have many more and i i pray that we can reach out to one another whenever we have days of importance and seasons of importance in this way we would be able to not only educate one another but learn from each other and if we become closer, I'm sure those who follow us will definitely take cue. Thank you very much. May the Almighty bless you all. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.